Good afternoon. My name is Duffy Cooley. I'm the field CTO at iSurveillance. Today, we're going to be conducting a workshop on getting familiar with security observability using eBBF and Cilium Tetragon. Try using these ones. <laughs> and my name is Raphael Pinson. I'm a solutions architect also at iSurveillance. And I'll be yeah, doing it with you. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> so to get started, I'm going to actually take you through a presentation kind of describing the concepts and the and what we're going to be covering in the lab today. And then I'm going to turn it over to Raphael to drive the lab, but we're all going to be able to go through a hands on lab together. So I hope you brought your laptops. Um, you should only need Internet access. Nothing special. We're going to be using the and we're going to be using instruct to host the labs. And that's going to be how we go about that part of it. So our agenda for today is uh, Cilium and eBPF introduction. We're going to talk a little bit about like what we've been building at iSurveillance as part of the open source Cilium project. We're going to talk a little bit about Tetragon, and then we're going to jump into like some examples here, and then we're going to go into the lab. So first, um, <coughs> the open source projects that we work on at iSurveillance are Cilium and eBPF. We are actually have a lot of kernel maintainers in working at Isovalent directly working in eBPF in the kernel, pretty exciting, and Isovalent is the company behind it. We also provide a product that's called Cilium Enterprise. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that today, but if you'd like to know more, there's definitely a booth that will be happy to tell you all about it. So eBPF, is that, who here has heard of eBPF? I like seeing the number of hands go up higher and higher like every time, you know. It's great. Love to see it. So eBPF basically makes the Linux kernel programmable in a secure and efficient way. And it's uh, one of the analogs here is to say that it, it is like JavaScript in the browser, but eBPF is to the kernel. Another way to think about this, I'm probably drifting in and out of the microphone, I'm sorry about that, but I move around a lot when I talk. But um, another way to think about that is if you consider, that's probably a good idea. Do you want to switch to this microphone? No. You don't hear me. Okay. Um, Another way to think about that is if you think about the Linux kernel as an API, right? And when I want to open a file, when I want to open a socket, whenever I want to do anything else like that, I'm actually going to make an API call. eBPF gives me the ability to instrument any API call you can make to the Linux kernel. And when I instrument that API call, there are a lot of things I can do with it at that point. I can modify the inputs. I can, mod I can determine whether or not I want that API call to succeed or fail. There's a ton of capability there around how it works. And, in, and also, eBPF is written in a way that, like, if I were to write an eBPF program that would be applied to the kernel, the reason we say that it is a secure and efficient way is that that eBPF program has to go through a verifier to determine that that program will not actually crash the kernel that it's not an endless loop. It's going to make sure that this program is safe. It does a static code analysis before actually allowing this program to be injected into the kernel. And anybody who's written eBPF code, a couple of you, nice. You can probably probably have a, a colorful four-letter acronym for the for the verifier because it can be very difficult to work with sometimes. But but it actually does a very important job of making sure that the code that we do inject in the kernel is safe. And it's efficient because it's basically running at native kernel speeds. So these are some of the attachment points. And in this particular demonstration, we're going to be playing with a couple of these things, the, um, the file descriptor, block device things. We're going, to be talk we're going to be showing some of that stuff in our demo. We're also going to be talking about sockets, opening new connections to URLs and those sorts of things. And when we get into the security observability piece, we're going to be showing you how those events or how, how we instrument those things and how the events that surface from those actions can be made relevant in a security observability space. So <coughs> that's a kind of a high level overview of what eBPF is and what we've been doing with it. One of the first things that we thought about at Isovalent was kind of thinking about, I mean, we, were, we, we had Thomas Graff who's very invested in eBPF in the kernel space. We had um, Dan Borkman, we had a few other like really incredible founding engineers that were really focused on eBPF in the Linux kernel. A lot of them already had some experience with networking, right? So Thomas and I met when he was working on the Open vSwitch project. Anybody heard of the Open vSwitch project? That's kind of neat. <laughs> I don't think it's aged terribly well, but 
it was a, it was an incredible experience in trying to develop effectively what was the first platform that defined software defined networking so a lot of the core of our company the founding engineers come from that sort of a mindset and they started thinking well can we apply ebpf to this ebpf originally was built to be a net filter replacement originally it was built to be to be something that actually helped um, manipulate things much in the same way that you might think of IP tables. And then it, it was extended after that because now we actually have this new capability in the Linux kernel. So now <coughs> eBPF actually has been extended to be able to do a lot more than that. It's able to do things at the application layer, all kinds of good stuff. So Cilium was the first effort that we've put together and this is a um, container networking interface for, the, um, for, a, uh, for a Kubernetes cluster where we run a Cilium agent on every node, and just as uh, a regular CNI operates, when you see a new pod get created on a kubelet, the kubelet makes a call to the CNI, and in Cilium's case, we actually generate an eBPF program for that pod and connect that using the TC layer to the network namespace that that pod has been, has been created in, and then we use you know, TC calls and these, so and these sorts of tools in eBPF to manipulate or and enforce things like network policy, right? So we can do, so if you've written Kubernetes network policy before and you're saying like this application can talk to these other applications in this other namespace, how many people have written network policy? So there are more people in the room that have heard of eBPF <laughs> than there are people who have written network policy, that's awesome. So with this, we can actually implement network policy in eBPF. So every pod that comes up, every time you make a change to network policy, every time network policy is applied, we're able to rewrite or extend the information that we passed to this eBPF program and implement this directly in eBPF in the Linux kernel to allow or deny traffic um, for its destination or even traffic incoming to the application itself, which is pretty cool. Another thing that we can do there <coughs> is that we can, um, inside of a Kubernetes cluster, there's another component called kubeproxy. And kubeproxy is sort of the internal load balancer for Kubernetes. So when your application is trying to access a cluster IP or a service inside of the same cluster, the way that that works right now for most clusters out there is that kubeproxy will, when, on the creation of the service, implement in IP tables uh, effectively that service, the service abstraction. And so when that packet leaves your application, it's destined for that cluster IP, IP tables will pick it up and it will make a routing decision about which endpoint to send that traffic to. It will nap the traffic and then send that traffic off to the endpoint that is chosen. In our case with Cilium, we can replace kubeproxy and again, do all of that in the eBPF program that we've written for every pod. So when we, det when we see a socket connection happen at the eBPF layer, right, you've made that API call, I want to curl another service within the cluster, perhaps in another namespace. As soon as we see that socket happen, we can determine, okay, what's the destination IP? Is that destination a service IP? If it's a service IP, I need to go and look at the healthy endpoints for that service IP and make a routing decision about where to send that traffic. We're doing all of this in eBPF. And then finally, one of the Big takeaways, I mean, all of you that have heard of eBPF have probably heard of eBPF in the context of observability, right? The idea that you could implement eBPF to get more information about what's happening. I mean, if you look at things like Pixie, if you look at things like our own Tetragon or Hubble observability, there's a ton of context that eBPF can give you because it has a view at what, of, of what's happening at the kernel layer. And that's, again, a first-class piece of Cilium and a first-class piece of pretty much everything we've written, whether it's Cilium, the, the CNI, or whether it's Tetragon, more in the application space. We're going to get to it in a minute to kind of talk a little bit more about it. But observability is like a first-class use case in everything that we built. So this slide actually talks a little bit more, a little bit more about kind of the entire product suite or the way that we think about the entire project in general, right? We think about Cilium as the, C the Cilium CNI piece here at the bottom. That is basically what I've been talking about before. And I was giving you a kind of high level overview, but you can see that it has a lot of advanced capabilities. It can do network policy at the layer seven network layer. We can also do layers, uh, we can also do network policy on FQDNs, again, all implemented in IP tables or in uh, eBPF. We can enable encryption on the underlying nodes. You can use IPsec or WireGuard. With load balancing, you can do 
We can replace the Kubernetes load balancing mechanism, which I spoke about before. We also have other more advanced load balancing mechanisms, like actually running Cilium as an external load balancer that can make use of things like maglev, which is a mechanism by which you can have multiple load balancers and they all understand the, the right path back to a already connected to service and that sort of stuff. Or you can do DSR. And then in the networking space, we can, under, we can do things like flatten the network um, between multiple Kubernetes clusters so that you can create things like a global service and have that global service be serviced by backends in multiple clusters. Pretty cool stuff. And obviously we work in all of the different cloud environments. And in those cloud environments, we've been generally chosen as either a very important partner to those cloud, env cloud environments, or we've been chosen as the default, in depend depending on where you're looking. So in AWS EKS, for example, we're the default, the Cilium OSS is the default CNI for AWS EKS. If you go to Azure, we've just announced in the last KubeCon, a very large partnership with them. And when you're spinning up an, EK an AKS cluster today, you can actually select open source Cilium as your CNI, or you can also select uh, Cilium Enterprise if there's more value to you th in that way with Azure. We support Alibaba Cloud. We have an OpenShift operator for both OSS and Enterprise. Same thing for VMware and for um, Google Cloud. We are, Cilium, op Cilium is the underlying uh, technology behind Google's data plane V2. All right, and then over here on the right is this new project that's actually one of our newer projects that we actually just announced, I think it was the last in the last KubeCon, about Tetragon. And Tetragon really introduces a completely different implementation. And I just wanna focus on that for just a moment and then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the detail here. So as, you, as, as you've already kind of put together, this stack on the left is really more about networking. It's really more about networking. And then Cilium Hubble is the observability suite. Where do we send our metrics? How do we handle tracing? Is there, how, do we can, how can I understand the connectivity between my applications in a visual way? We're starting to implement many of the use cases of service mesh in Cilium as features, which we call service which we call service mesh. So we're implementing things like ingress in the form of gateway API. We're, we're implementing things like authentication. MTLS is coming soon. It's not here yet, but I'm really excited to see it. Raphael and I have seen it live in, the, uh, in our all hands. It was pretty exciting. Um, but over here on the right, this red box is Tetragon. And it's a new project that implements a completely different part of the Linux kernel. Instead of implementing things at the network namespace, and trying to do things like network level enforcement and those sorts of things, we're actually implementing a different place where, and where anything, where, where, where it's basically the front door of Linux kernel itself, so that we can see every system call that goes through and make a decision, or we can enable you to configure Tetragon to watch for anything that happens in the Linux kernel and make a decision about what to do with that, right? Whether to send an event. Perhaps I want to understand any time, any process, anywhere in the cluster, tries to do a set UID system call, right? Set UID is a system call that you would use to make an executable, executable by somebody perhaps in a different privilege set than you have, right? So if you wanted to make, I don't know, sudo, something that could be used by any user, you might use a set UID system call to change the permission of, the, of that binary so that anybody could actually operate or execute that binary. In that context, Tetragon can be configured so that it's watching for the set UID system call, and if it sees any process anywhere I make it, then it will gather a bunch of information about that process, whether that process was successful, whether it was not successful, and it will emit, and by default, it will emit an event whenever it sees these things, giving you a lot of context about what happened, right? Where was this process? Was it inside of a container? Was that container part of a pod? Was that pod in a namespace? Which cluster was it a part of? Like the, all of the relevant questions that you would need to be really be able to kind of put together a story of where this happened, when this happened, and did it work, right? You can imagine how this is relevant because in security observability, some of the use cases that we're targeting are, right? You come to work on Monday, something terrible has happened over the weekend. Your manager has come to you and said, <laughs> I need to know everything about what happened on Saturday. It seems as though someone exfiltrated a bunch of data from my environment it was headed for this uh, weird URL. Can you show me everything you know about it? In most Kubernetes clusters, this is gonna be really tough <laughs> because like 
you're gonna, you're going to be in a position where you're like you can you, the best thing you could say is like can can you do it again and then I could I can see if I can find it you know like I can go look at the audit logs so what was the IP address of that pod at the time those IP addresses are ephemeral there's like you can see the number of problems that those things represent with Tetragon you get an event stream and all of those events can be sent to your Splunk or to an S uh, to a sim etc and because the way because of the way that we're gathering context around all of those events those events become a rich body of data that can be used to answer these particular questions so these are some of the adopters of Cilium and Tetragon. We've been working with lots and lots of customers, both open source and um, and both en and enterprise uh, agreements. If you are an adopter of Cilium or if you're using Tetragon, I do request that you go to our GitHub. So github.com slash Cilium. You're going to find a user's document in there. Go ahead and put your name in there and say that you're using it. If you're using it, whether it's open source, that, that would be tremendous. This is all part of our effort to get to graduation of this project. So if you're a company that is making use of Cilium, go put your name on the users list. Thank you very much. So Tetragon, <coughs> it's like, as I said, it is the newest open source project in Cilium. It's EVPF based, which means it's high performance and has zero mo modifications are required to the application itself. And it hooks into kernel functions after parameters are copied. So as I said before, when we actually surface an event that we have gathered about what's happened inside of the Linux kernel, we instrument that uh, uh, with that, that event with information that makes it easy to understand contextually when, who, how, why it happened, whether it was successful. Now, one thing I, it mentions in this slide that I haven't talked about is that action of emitting an event is just one of the actions that is available to you, right? You can also do things like kill the process. So if I saw somebody running a set UID call and I wanted to actually make it so that that was just not possible in, in any process in the entirety of the cluster, whether running inside of a container or running on the underlying host OS, I could actually implement a Tetragon policy, a tracing policy that would block the set UID system call across the board everywhere. If you want to know more about Tetragon, you can also go to our GitHub there. So that's github.com slash Cilium slash Tetragon. With Cilium Tetragon, with Cilium Tetragon, eBPF makes it dynamic. Um, that example I talked about with set UID, one of the other ways to solve that particular problem is an, uh, an older Linux technology called SecComp or secure computing. Secure computing and SecComp and those, and a lot of these uh, models, um, actually I'm curious, how many people have heard of SecComp? Nice. So you understand that SecComp is something that you can implement, but you have to do it before the process starts because you have to associate that process with that SecComp policy before the process starts. You can't dynamically change it. So if you wanted to add more to the SecComp policy or modify it in some way, you have to restart that process to pick up the change to the policy that you've written. But in eBPF, that's not the case, right? This is an eBPF program that I'm gonna inject or insert into the Linux kernel and associate it with particular calls, and I can do that dynamically. It means that if I wanted to continuously iterate on the number of system calls that I wanted to block or change in a, sec in a SecComp model, I could actually just iterate on it directly. Or I could wait for, in the, in the case of the, the, the set UID call, um, this particular call is required by most container runtimes to be able to create the container itself. So if you blocked it, Globally on a Kubernetes cluster, you'd have a really bad day. <laughs> but if you were using something like uh, if you were using something like Cilium Tetragon to make that policy, you could apply that policy after the pod had been created. Which means that the system, the set UID system calls that are needed by the container runtime have already taken place, and now you're saying from this point where the program application where the application is started, I now want to apply this policy, and from here on no set UID calls can run from the from within these containers. <coughs> it, as, a, as we talked about before, it protects the pre-existing processes, use, uses kernel knowledge to hook into sufficiently stable functions, and multiple, and can handle multiple coordinated eBPF programs. Right, so you can actually take action. This is where, like, for example, when we see that there is a event that we want to trigger on, 
what are the actions that we want to actually have ha uh, happen when we see those things happen. And there is also some in-kernel in, in -kernel event filtering. As you're going to be able to see here in just a little while when we get to the labs, when you're looking at the amount of event data that we can produce, it can be a lot. Right? There's a ton of event data that we can produce. And the question often comes, well, like, how can I limit how much information I, I'm actually going to get out of that so that I can only tar target those things that I care about and send that to Splunk so I'm not sending everything to Splunk. So we do have in-kernel event filtering, and we also have user space filtering, right? So once the event has come down and we're, propagate, we're propagating that event into, a, into the stream that, we're that you're going to send to whatever collection you're looking for, you can also filter it at that point. So I like this slide because it really kind of hits something that I always like to say, which is context is everything. <laughs> context is king. If you don't have context about these things, it becomes very difficult to actually understand it, right? If you can't measure it, you don't, you can't, you can't improve it, etc. So in this case, where the 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 example here is that you would write policy when you see that when you see malicious detector behavior when you see malicious behavior detected, you can actually make sure that you get an alert that is actionable. You can send that alert to logs. You can you can actually have that alert take an action, etc. But the important piece is it's not just telling you, hey, somebody made this system call. It's telling you this process running inside of this pod, running inside of this namespace, running inside of this cluster made this system call at this time, and it was successful. Right? There's a lot of information that you can gather here. And it's not just system calls. Right? You can do these things with, uh, you could, we actually just recently implemented file integrity monitoring. So when we, the first time we see a file get touched, we take a checksum of that file, and we store it in an eBPF map. The next time we see that um, file system, that file get touched, if the checksum is different, then we understand that it's different, and we can alert you on the fact that the file is no, that the file integrity has been changed. How does it all work, though? <coughs> so Tetragon runs much the same way that Cilium does in the form of a daemon set. And just like Cilium, it can also run on virtual machines or other external entities directly. Tetragon does not require that Cilium is also deployed. You can run Tetragon only. And in fact, we're seeing a number of customers trying to solve the security observability use case specifically doing exactly that because it can actually give them a lot more context, a lot more data about what's happening in their runtimes without having to actually change the underlying CNI to accomplish it. Because it runs as a daemon set, it is going to instrument the Linux kernel on every node in your cluster or every machine that you apply a Tetragon agent to. And <coughs> through, the, um, through the CRD in your Kubernetes cluster, you can go ahead and configure Tetragon such that it will be able to handle all of the all of the events that you're, you're trying to look for. Some examples of the things that you can actually key on are, are, are here in this graph. So process execution, syscall execution, file access. We can look for interesting patterns in TCP. We can look for namespace escapes. We can look for privilege escalations. Has somebody done a sudo inside of a container or has a process tried to change out of the PID namespace that it was started in into another PID namespace, et cetera? We can understand data access. We can also expose metrics um, because we are able to instrument the Linux kernel directly here. We can actually look at the data, the data that's going by and expose metrics for HTTP, for DNS, and for TLS. So one of the other questions that people can ask in a security observability use case is something like, what TLS ciphers are, cipher suites are in use? This is, I mean, this is frequently a compliance check or a compliance control that you have to satisfy in your infrastructure, right? All of the workloads in your cluster cannot be, can, none of the workloads in your cluster can use TLS cipher suites of this particular, of this particular type. How would you audit that today, right? Like, <laughs> it would be pretty difficult. I know that some of you have probably faced that challenge, but with this, it would actually be pr relatively easy because we have that context already and we're producing it at the user space level. So some of the questions that you could be asking questions, and some of the things that you could be asking questions about is network traffic, right? We have layer seven parsers, so we can actually take a look at the network socket layer and say, you know, for this, ap this application tried to make a curl command, and that curl command tried to connect to this DNS path, to this DNS name, google.com or whatever. And 
we can actually show you what the resolved name was. We can actually, uh, we have DNS parsers to make sure that we understand at the time of that execution what the resolved IP address was, whether they were trying to do like a bypass of DNS, if you're doing like a, you know, any of that stuff. We can also instrument file and IO activity. So anytime somebody touches a file, anytime somebody, you know, you can actually protect whole directories or just specific files, any, rec any running executables and whether new ones have been spawned at a later date and obviously system call and, and changing privileges and namespace boundaries as well. Now some of the examples of how we implement this. So this is an example of a tracing policy and you're gonna be, you're gonna be playing with this directly here in just a minute. So in this example the, of the tracing policy, we're looking for that set UID system call. And specifically, So this one is interesting because we're looking for that particular system call and when we see it, we're just going to emit an event on it. And this is an example of what we might see of how we might be able to query that data in Splunk, right? So this example looks at all of the event data. It looks for the binary bin sh and it looks for what's actually hap what, you know, when that process was started and tries to actually produce this data in a, in a relatively time. So in this example, we're looking for anything that actually happened after five minutes from the time that the initial, the initial process inside of that container started. This is actually making use of the Tetragon CLI. So the Tetragon CLI can actually show you, it can parse those events and make them a little bit easier to understand. So in this example, we're saying, if you have written the policy that says anybody trying to make a write to root.ssh authorized keys, we should just kill that process right away and emit an event around it, right? And so here in this example are some, uh, some of the example events that you would see in that case. Somebody tried to be, it's, well actually that doesn't quite line up with the text, but you get the idea. In this case, it's saying if somebody actually wrote to Etsy Shadow, instead of actually allowing that write, I want to kill it. So you might still see the number of bytes that, are, that would go into the file, but that file will not actually be written because the process will be killed before the write can happen. We can also monitor and prevent capability abuse, right? So if somebody's using NS Enter to move back and forth between different, between different namespaces within the same Linux kernel, this is something that we can detect because it is all within our scope inside of the Linux kernel itself. And that is the introduction. So now we're gonna go into the lab. Before I jump over, before we jump over to um, Raphael's la uh, laptop here, this is the link to the lab iso go dot two slash k c c n c u c e u dash tetragon. Take a picture, write it down. This is where we're going. This is where we're going to spend the rest of the time here in this afternoon. So this is iso go dot two kubecon cloud native con e u dash tetragon. Once Raphael takes over, I'm going to come around and make sure that everybody understands how to get how to get there. But this is the lab that we're going to start up. And when you go to that URL, you're going to see two labs. The first one is the open source one. So I want you to click on that one. And then it will take a couple minutes to start up. And while we're waiting for that to happen, Tetragon, uh, sorry, Ra Raphael will tell you a little bit about what the lab is going to cover and we're going to jump into it. Don't raise your hand if you haven't taken a picture of the URL or if you don't know what the URL is. Sweet. Okay, that means that everybody has what they need here and I can move on, right? Awesome. Thanks, Duffy. Let's change the laptops. Some time, so <laughs> how does this work? 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit slow. <coughs> Is there your phone? I was going to take a pass. One more thing I wanted to point out is that there are standing microphones in the aisles. So if at any time you have a question during the lab, or if there's anything you want more clarity on or anything, I'm going to be walking around trying to answer your questions, but there are a lot of you. And so if there's anything that would, anything you would like to ask, you can actually come to one of the standing microphones and ask that question, and we'll be able to answer it here. For the record, I added the TLS visibility because you mentioned it. Oh, cool. Yes. I'm not allowed. So hi everyone, you should be getting to this page if your access to the internet is working fine. So we're gonna go through this, uh, these uh, Instruct labs. So they're, they're based on a platform called Instruct that actually uses uh, VM in the cloud. In this case, we'll be v using VM in Google Cloud, but you don't need to have an account. You don't need to care about this. This will all be uh, in your web browser. There's three labs that are listed here. The one we're going to concentrate on at this point is the first one, which is based on Tetragon open source and will show Tetragon from a CLI perspective. Um, I will go slowly and explain things and take the time to follow up with you, uh, um, follow, up, follow along with you on this lab. But if you want to go faster, you want to run ahead, you can do that totally and you can do the, the next labs. Actually, uh, we have about 20 labs in total that are available at this address here, um, isovillain.com slash labs. You don't need the resource library, it's just a redirection. So isovillain.com slash labs, and you have about 20 labs here that uh, talk about Cilium, Hubble, Tetragon, lots of things. All these labs are entirely free. The only reason why we provide the invitation is you don't need to go through the marketing, uh, you know, <laughs> giving your name and address. So the three ones here, you won't have to give your name and address. But if you want to take the other labs and you have questions about them as, as it goes, if it doesn't disrupt the whole thing, you know, feel free to do that as well. This is perfectly fine. So let's get started with this first lab. I'll start it right away and I'll talk about it a bit. So this is, um, this is actually the first lab that we made with Tetragon. So just, um, uh, Duffy explained a little bit, Tetragon is the newest of the projects within the Cilium projects, of the open source projects within the Cilium project. And it was released during uh, KubeCon in Valencia last year. But it actually has a history. So if you do check out the enterprise-based labs that are listed afterwards, they may be actually older than Tetragon itself uh, because Tetragon was actually part of uh, the Eyes of Elysium Enterprise uh, 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 tooling before it was open source. So what was open source is part of what was part of the, the enterprise offering before. Um, you can have a look at the explanations that I hear while this is loading. So it takes usually about a, a minute, one, one to two minutes to start the VM under the hood. This is starting a new VM for you. You'll have your own VM. You can do whatever you want with it. If you want to trash it, crash it, you know, just look around, whatever. I don't personally care what you do with the VM. Uh, but don't ask questions on why it's not working if you actually trash the whole VM, <laughs> right? So Duffy talked about the need for security observability and how Cilium Tetragon solves this. So as he said, the idea is we can actually plug to a lot of the APIs in the kernel, a lot of the syscalls, the K probes, U probes, and so on using Tetragon and attach to events in the kernel and actually um, derive information from these events or even react to uh, this information. Um, there's a book as well, and it so happens that I think this book is available at the Azovian uh, booth, and uh, one of the authors, Natalia, I don't know if Jed is around, but Natalia is here, and she can actually sign the book if you want. <laughs> Just saying. So this is a book that's related to Tetragon, and the, this lab is actually taken from this book that was released last year. All right, let's get started. I think if you click roughly at the same time as me, your lab should have started already. So you should have a green button at the, bot at the bottom, at the, in the lower uh, right corner. You click that green button and you'll have this beautiful interface. So this is the instruct interface. So here we have the instructions on the right. Um, the instructions are foldable, there's foldable sections. 
So here, these are the instructions from the first section. If you need, you can actually resize the column on the right. If you want to see the instructions they had, the slides they had before, you can actually see them if you click the button at the top of the column here. And um, and here we have the tab. So there's one tab for the terminal. We're going to do things in the terminal. And feel free as well, we added a tab for feedback, which is essentially a Google form. Uh, if you have problems with it and you want to report without asking me or else you can raise your hand or pick up a mic and ask a question. Don't hesitate if you have questions during uh, during the session. Uh, this is perfectly fine. So let's have a look at what we have already. Cube control get node. I hope this is big enough. I'll see if I can zoom a bit. Well, in this interface not happy to zoom. I don't know why. <laughs> is it big enough for everyone? Can you see? I mean the screen is quite big. No, it's not. Oh. But you have the same thing on your la laptop. Is that better? Yes, great. Thank you. In the back as well? Yes, great. Yeah, you have extra screens. So um, what do we have here? You are uh, in a VM, actually you have your own VM, and there is a cluster that has started. It's a kind cluster, and at the moment it only has one node. We're only gonna work with one node. There's no point in actually demoing this with several nodes. In production, you will be using several nodes. So we only have a one node cluster with a control plane. That's fine enough for our demo. And what we're going to do is install Cilium, uh, install Tetragon, sorry, not Cilium. We're not going to install Cilium. This is actually uh, a cluster that doesn't use Cilium, actually. And as you can see, the cluster is marked as ready. The node is marked as ready. And we didn't inst install Cilium, so that means the CNI is ready. And it actually uses the default CNI in kind, which is not Cilium. So we're going to add the Helm repository uh, for Cilium, which contains the, the Helm charts for Cilium, for Hubble, and for Tetragon, and then install uh, Tetragon, so up updating the Helm repo, and then installing Cilium Tetragon with uh, the option tetragon.export deny list equals empty. All right, so nothing special here, right? We're just installing using Helm. This is pretty simple. Uh, Cilium Tetragon runs as a daemon set, like uh, Duffy was explaining, like Cilium, which means that you'll have a Tetragon pod on every node. So only one here in this case, because we only have one node. If you had several nodes, you'll have one pod on each node. And the reason for this is that just like Cilium configures the node uh, for um, networking reasons, it configures, it injects eBPF programs and configures eBPF maps for routing and network policy decisions. Uh, or services to replace QProxy. In this case, Tetragon will inject eBPF programs and manipulate eBPF maps for security observability and enforcement reasons. So let's see if Tetragon is actually rolled out. Yes, in my case, Tetragon is rolled out. The, the, the pod is uh, started. You can have a look here. It's deployed by default in the kube system. Uh, no, it's not by default, actually, I specified it. Um, it's deployed in the kube system namespace. And I can see here, I'll close this a little bit there, that I have indeed a Tetragon pod that is running. Yeah. Works better? Okay. Oh yeah, let's go have one. Yeah, great. Now we <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Yes, indeed. Thank you. So Tetragon has been deployed. Uh, it might take a little bit longer for you, I don't know, um, but normally it's fine. The networking anyways that is the cloud networking, so it should be fine. And now we're going to install on our machine the Tetragon CLI. This is, this is optional, right? But what that will give you is that you'll have this, uh, so I put it here in user local bin Tetragon, and this is a binary, it's a Go binary. Uh, that we'll be using to actually um, format nicely the, the JSON logs that we get from Tetragon. So it will give us some nice colors and emojis so we understand better what's happening. 
Again, this is totally optional, and if you want, you could just extract the JSON, send it to your favorite uh, CM platform, and do stuff with it there. Next, now that we have Tetragon, Tetragon itself is not gonna do much um, by default, so we'll need to add a tracing policy. And like Duffy was showing before, a tracing policy is essentially, it's, um, it's a custom resource, so uh, when we installed Tetragon, it added a custom resource definition. We can actually get a look at this. It's not in the description, in the instructions, right? But you see, if I describe the custom resource definitions on my cluster, I now have tracing policies and tracing policy uh, namespace. The namespace one are uh, pretty uh, recent in Tetragon, and they allow you to define either global tracing policies or namespace tracing policies. Here we're gonna use global tracing policies. I'm sorry, may I ask a question? Or sure. it's, I should ask somebody else. Okay. No, no, that's uh, fine. Oh, you're here, uh, sorry. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, uh, there, is, there are tracing policies, and it says that there are three of them, but if you open the file, I think there are only two. Where is the third one? All right, let, let's get to this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let, let's have a look at the file indeed. So these tracing policies are giving instructions to configure Tetragon so that it will create eBPF programs to, uh, to trace what's happening on our node. So let's have a look at this one. It's provided, it's called TCP Connect. Oh yeah, that might be, that might be an issue. Uh, yeah, th I think there used to be three and we reduced it to two. Yeah, so I might need to change this, thank you. So here we have a tracing policy that we call network connection. We're going to deploy it. Uh, again, the, by default, tracing policies are not namespace, they're global, so they won't be linked to a specific namespace. It will apply to everything in our cluster. And we have two K probes, so K stands for kernel, kernel probes, so we will attach to uh, events in a kernel, uh, e a K probe kind of events in a kernel, and specifically to uh, calls uh, linked to TCP connect and TCP close. And we will map the arguments uh, uh, that, that come out of these events, so the first argument is of type socket here, and second argument is of type socket, and this is to help Tetragon know uh, how to map these arguments to the JSON that will result. Right, so let's apply this first one. There you go, shouldn't take long. So here I can actually list my tracing policies, and you see I have one that was applied six seconds ago, and obviously if I look at it, I will see the content of it in YAML. Fine, great. And the second tracing policy that we will apply is called sys write its Kubernetes manifests. And again, it will use uh, K probes and we'll have three rules here. The first rule is an FD install, file descriptor install um, uh, call, and we're looking for uh, calls to FD install where the, the um, where the argument matches etc kubernetes manifests. So we're looking for actions that will uh, affect this file, etc kubernetes manifest, file or, or directory in this case, right? The second one is a sysclose, and the third one is a syswrite, so uh, closing the file descriptor or writing to the file. So we're going to apply this again, so I just copy here and paste, you can easily copy and paste, right? That when you have instructions on the right, if you just left click, it will copy to your uh, copy buffer. So just apply this. And now we're going to look at the logs that are produced. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look, there's a container in the Tetragon uh, pod that is called export STD out. And it will, uh, the, the, the logs of this pod, of this container, will contain the, the Tetragon logs in JSON format. So I can show you without piping into Tetragon Observe actually. So you'll see exactly what it looks like. And here we're following. So you see, I get JSON logs. This is great. <laughs> Not very readable maybe. So we're piping this into Tetragon Observe, which is the local uh, common line tool that you downloaded earlier. And it will actually analyze this and show us nice little icons and colors so that we can actually uh, not lose our mind looking at JSON. 
right? So as you see, there's, there's a lot of logs coming out of this. Uh, some logs are linked to file being opened, file being, files being written, or to TCP connect events that we added from the first rule. So we have uh, actions, logs coming from the two tracing policies that we added. All right, everybody's fine with this? Anyone having a, an issue with this first step? No, you're good. Let's continue, check. <laughs> so if you followed properly the, the different steps, the check should pass fine. So next, what we're going to do is, this is taken from, from the book on, on security uh, visibility based on Tetragon, like I said, and we're going to look at detecting a container escape using Tetragon. So the idea is that we have, there's this uh, pod that's running uh, in a privileged mode, and it allowed an attacker to actually, uh, to actually escape uh, the container. And so we're going to see how we could detect this. Um, so what, was gonna, what the attacker will do is enter that privilege pod from there, gain access to the node, and from the node actually create a static pod and ETC Kubernetes manifest so that they have a permanent foot on the machine, and then from that pod do whatever they want, right? Run script or whatever. So we're gonna see how we can detect these events and could potentially alert on this or even kill them. Potentially, because as you saw, killing is, is not, we don't talk about this in this lab really, but it's not too hard. It would be just changing the action at the bottom of the tracing policy so that instead of logging, we would just kill the process, right? So now we have two terminals in this one. Uh, so pay attention when we change terminals in the instructions. Um, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna start by checking uh, events in the Tetragon logs related to a pod called privilege pod. And you see here, when you run Tetragon observe, you can actually filter by pod name. If you're familiar with Hubble, this is the same logic, right? We have the same kind of, of option here. Right now, nothing's happening. This privilege pod does not exist, but we're launching this in the first terminal so that when it happens, we see it right away. Okay, so let's switch to terminal two in the tabs up there. And in terminal two, we're going to apply this privilege pod.yaml. Let's have a look at it. Privilege pod.yaml, you see this is a pretty simple pod. Uh, in production, most likely it wouldn't be a pod like this. It might have been deployed by a deployment, you know, whatever. For some reason, there is this pod that is running and it so happens that it has a security context set to privilege true, which is going to trigger the issue in our case, right? So let's apply this privilege pod privilege pod the YAML. <laughs> then we'll check if the pod has started and might take a little while. You see it took five seconds. Now my pod is running. So, you know, check that your pod is actually running. Now, if we go back to terminal one and it's taking a little while, so let's wait a little bit. There's a, there's a buffer in the events, so that might be the reason. See, let's start it again. Nice. <laughs> uh, is it started? All right. I have my two tracing policy. This is fine. This should be fine. Everything's fine. Are you seeing something on your side? The namespace is wrong. Where? No, but that's, that should be fine. That should be fine. Really? Hmm. It shouldn't have to be restarted. All right, I'll have to check this. <laughs> uh, let's restart Tetragon in case. Uh, cube system. So, oh, cube system. Let's see. It's restarting, obviously. And now we see it. Okay. So, if you have that issue, I'll post the comment here. You can restart Tetragon. It shouldn't happen. I'll have to check why. Uh, 
So cube control minus n cube system rollout restart demon set tetragon that will restart or just kill the pod. There's only one pod, right? So now when we check, we actually see the process being started. So there's an nginx uh, process that is started in this default slash uh, privilege pod. Great, or almost great, but great. Fine. Let's continue. <laughs> so let's go back to terminal two. We have our pod that was started and we're going to exec into that pod and start a shell, a bin bash shell into that pod, right? What happens is when we go back to terminal one, we can see what's being executed here. So we see bash being executed. We see that it's executed in the default privilege pod context. And then in there, we see everything that is linked to opening and closing files that is linked to bash being executed. So we see the ld.so being open, uh, all the libraries that are loaded, the TTY is being open, and so on. And there's actually an ls, because uh, I typed ls. I wasn't supposed to do this, but I typed ls. So we see ls and all the libraries being uh, open and closed to make ls function. Right, now in terminal two, we're going to take advantage of the fact that this part is privileged by using ns enter ns enter minus t1 minus a bash and as you may know this will allow us to uh, bypass the isolation of this container and actually access the the machine uh the under underlying node yeah what we're doing I don't yes sorry I'm trying to get my microphone to work okay so what we're doing is we're actually moving into all of the namespaces associated with PID1. And because this is a privileged pod that actually has access to the host PID namespace, the first PID in this one is probably in its system, right? So this could be system D. When we do an NS enter like this, we're basically saying, I want to be inside the network namespace. I want to be inside the file system namespace. I want to be inside the PID namespace, all of the namespaces. I want to move directly into that group of namespaces that the PID, the PID one on the underlying host is in. Thanks, Duffy, for the advanced explanation. So, yeah, so thanks to this, we get access to the host namespace, which means we're now, we've, we've kind of escaped from our container. Right, so, um, we essentially broke out of the container. If we look at the at the terminal one again, um, oops, we can see here. Um, oh, sorry, yeah, default privilege. Uh, we can see the NS center. Where is it? I see LS. I don't see the NS center. This looks weird. Okay, I hope I'm not seeing bugs here. <laughs> This is a, I think, because it's standard out, it's a bit of a ring buffer. So if you see a bunch of events, yeah, yeah, by, it, it might just take a while because yeah. of the of the ring buffer. Yeah, there's not if enough. You, if you exit and you go back and you do NS enter again, then you should see the event go by again. Yeah. Mm, yeah, there. So now I have the LS. <laughs> well, it looks like the tracing policy we so, have implemented is Yeah, the the events might take a while because there's there's a ring buffer, so. Um, it needs to have enough events before it gets exported. So we'll see the NS enter eventually. I think it gets flushed on a regular basis, though. I think we may be missing a tracing policy, unfortunately. Hmm? Process exec is. See the LS? I don't see NS enter. Oh, there. I have the NS enter here. Right. So NS enter here, and then from the NS enter, uh, you can actually see that it actually executes bash afterwards and then uh, use it in groups, bash, geo colors, and so on. So we can see what's being executed uh, in this context. Right, so now that we're running bash and we're pretty much root on the host, actually, uh, we're, we're actually on, on the host. How could we see this? Um, yeah, we're, we're on the can, can control plane host. You see here that the node name, this is not inside the, the, the container, inside the pod. This is, well, this is inside the container, but it's the container that works as a host in a kind cluster, right? 
So now that we're running on the on the host, which is a container in the context of kind, the next step will be to maintain a foothold there. So what we want to do is create a static pod that will always be running uh, and will give us success uh, whenever we want as an attacker, right? With being the bad guys in this case. So let's get the, the Tetragon logs again from the uh, export STD out container. Uh, do a Tetragon observe and we'll filter on privilege pod or hack latest or continuity runtime or proc self exe. Uh, there wasn't a way to have a single common, clean common to get this. So we're just grepping in this case, so we don't need to run a common every time so we see all the events we're interested in. And if we don't grep, then there'll be tons of events. So, so now let's again get into our container, <laughs> into our privilege pod. Uh, we do the NS enter again so that we access the host uh, namespace. And now we're going to go into etc Kubernetes manifest there, okay there which obviously means that we're on the host because this does not exist in the, the pod that we accessed originally. And in there, you see all the static pods that, that are there. It's the Cube API server. That's because we're on the control uh, plane node in this case. And we're going to create a new pod, which is called hack latest. As you can see, this is just a normal pod, uh, it's called hack latest. It has access to the host network and the, n the namespace does not exist. This is a little bit of, um, of a hack here which will make it invisible uh, to uh, 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 cube control in our case uh, because uh, the namespace actually does not exist. This is, a, this is a very interesting one also because I, I'm curious how many people are familiar with Etsy Kubernetes manifests? Are you aware of that directory? Okay, that directory exists as part of the project of KubeADM or K-U-B-E-A-D-M. And KubeADM is a tool that's part of the Kubernetes project um, that actually helps you get from basically a bunch of Docker hosts to a Kubernetes cluster. It's a provisioning tool. And the way that KubeADM provisions Kubernetes clusters is it uses the static manifest to host the API server, the control plane, the controller manager and etcd on the set of hosts using these static pod manifests and it's a pretty interesting thing static pod static post static pod manifests are owned and operated they live and die with the kubelet right as long as the kubelet sees the manifest in that predefined directory then it will start all of those manifests and manage the life cycle directly even if you could see these pods, like if you were to do cube kettle get pods inside of the cube system namespace, you'd be able to see the pods in there. And if you were to delete one of them, that would have no effect on the pod itself because it's a static pod. It's only managed by the kubelet. It's not managed by the API. The API only reports what it sees about those pods. That's why it's a static pod. If you wanted to stop one of those static pods, you would have to go to the file system where that static pod is defined and delete it or move it out of that directory. And that would be like one way to stop that particular pod, but you can't stop it with kubectl and you can't restart it with kubectl. So what we're doing here is we're defining yet another static pod manifest. This is the hack latest one and we're putting it in a namespace that doesn't exist. And because it's a static pod manifest, it's owned and operated by that kubelet, the kubelet is going to try to register that pod with the API server. I've created a new pod, it's called the hack latest, and it's in some namespace that doesn't exist. And so it will get the same error that you would get if you tried to apply a manifest in a namespace that doesn't exist. It will tell the kubelet there's no namespace called doesn't exist. And then the kubelet will say, okay, and it'll just keep going and keep managing this pod in silence until forever. fun times we had. <laughs> yeah. So because of this, we now have a pod that is actually running on the machine, right? Exactly. Uh, we can't see it with cube control because like, like uh, Duffy said, if I look here, cube control won't list it because it's not in a namespace that is known. So it's invisible to uh, a Kubernetes administrator, but it's running all right. We can see if we use 
uh, CRI control because Kind is not using Docker, it's using uh, CRI. Um, so if we use CRI control PS, we can see actually this pod running on the machine. And if we were to remove it, Kubelet would recreate it. So every time we restart the node, for example, this pod will actually start again. So now we have a permanent foothold. If we've deployed something in that image that lets us access the node again, that's it. As an attacker, I can come back whenever I want. And there's very high chances that the Kubernetes administrators won't see that pod running. So it might take a few seconds, but by now I think it should have started. So again, if you look at all the pods, you won't, you won't see it. Now let's look at Tetragon. And in Tetragon, we have some interesting events in there. Let's get back up a bit, just a bit. <laughs> so that's what I executed first when I got access to the privilege pod, I executed NS enter. And then you can see that I actually, um, what is this? Mm, let's go down a bit. So bash was executed here. Um, there was a cat that was executed. And here, um, you remember I did a cat with a here doc and I redirected it to the file. So this is what happened here. So this file was written, etc Kubernetes manifest hack latest.yaml. So Tetragon actually saw it. And you see here that we're not in the context of the privilege pod anymore. We're in the context of the kind control plane uh, node. And then we see a lot of things executing that is, are linked to uh, container D. And then the pod is starting, we get the init, we get run C and so on and so forth. So everything that is linked to that pod that is starting can be seen and could be traced with a Tetragon. So if all these events have been exported to your favorite scene, you could see in the history what actually happened and at what time it happened. Here we're only seeing a nicely formatted thing, but actually you get the timestamp, you get everything in the, in the JSON events. All right. So let's click next and continue. So now that we have access to this, um, to this uh, static pod, we could do something in there. So let's again look at the Tetragon logs. We're going to grab for privilege pod or curl or Python. Again, you could um, organize things around these events in your CM to actually detect things um, and, and search for events. So in terminal two, we're going to again access. Sorry. Is it possible also to detect, as you made, as kind is running uh, cry, is it possible to detect uh, with container D, for example, if it's running an invisible pod, like we, uh, like we did? Yeah, so, th so that's what we were seeing here. Cont uh, continuity actually, see, uh, oh, you mean on the host? On, for example, we are running GCP and GKE, so we, ha we are based on container D. Do you think it is yeah. possible that having access to the host uh, and uh, listing all the pods uh, on each host, of course, but... Uh, uh, well, so on the host, if you list all the pods, you actually see this. This is what we were seeing here. Um, so here, if I'm on the host and I, I use uh, CRI uh, control, I can actually see this uh, hack latest pod. Yeah, exactly. What, uh, what I mean is that if, because here we are running kind with cry, um, yeah, yeah. So if you were running something else, were you, were you running Docker or whatever, you could see it. You could see the the, the container started with with Docker, right? Oh, it's just Kube Control won't see it because it's running a namespace that doesn't exist. And the way Kube Control functions is, is is when you do when you list the pods for all namespaces, it will first get the nest, the list of all the namespaces and then request the pods for each of these namespaces. And because it's running in a namespace that doesn't exist, you will never see it. Did I answer your question? More or less? <laughs> All right, let's get the container ID for that, um, for that pod. 
like container here. So we just executed uh, CRI control PS to get the container ID, uh, same as you could do with, with Docker, for example, right? Um, and then with this container ID, we're going to, um, we're going to uh, exec into this container. So we're now inside the static uh, pod that we created earlier, right? So this is a static pod that potentially we could leave running that even if we restart the node, it will restart and will be invisible to uh, the, the administrators if they're not properly monitoring the cluster for this kind of events. And then from this, we could typically run some curl to execute a Python script, you know, once, several times. I'm doing some activity that shouldn't happen and it will be really hard to detect uh, from the administrators uh, because they don't even know that this pod is running. But if I look here in Tetragon, by the time this actually comes there, I can see here Python, uh, you will actually see the calls being done and you can see that it's done in the context of the kind control plane. In fact, you should see as well the connect that will come in a while once the, again, it's the buffering, the buffering thing because the Python script makes the call to the outside. So normally, and it's, it's executed actually, it's not running anymore. So we should see the connect events uh, coming in. I'll wait a little bit. Do some more calls. Try, try just sending a curl, yeah. You should see yeah. Curl. Sorry. It may not be part of your grep. Sorry, are you talking to me, Duffy? Yeah, it may not be part of the grep. That's maybe why you're missing it. I, I didn't hear what you said. The the challenge is that the the event you're looking for may not be in the in the grep match. Oh, really? Um, oh, you're right. There, curl. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it doesn't match. No, it, it should match. It should match curl. I think it's a buffering issue again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, let's see. All right, it worked last time I tried it. <laughs> Great, I don't know what's wrong. This problem would probably not happen in your environments because you'd be sending all of this event data to a Splunk or to a Sim or something like that. And you wouldn't be dropping these events. In this example, we're actually sending all of this data to standard out on the container. And then we're yeah. trying to grep that event in standard out, which is basically only buffered in the, in the container's um, standard out itself, which is still truncated. And this is what we mean by like, we may have missed the event because we were trying to catch it like in time and this may just not have happened fast enough. All right, well, sorry about that. Are you seeing it yourself? Is someone seeing it? Yeah? Okay, someone saw it. There's That's the good. curl right there. <laughs> Got it. Oh, here, here it comes. Again, this is a buffering issue. So yeah. So there, there you go. You can actually see the curl. So we could detect that thing. And we see it's in the context of the control plane itself. Because, sorry? Yeah. All right for the file and showing. So what, what's interesting here is we get this metadata as well, and there would be more metadata that we could get from the from the uh, JSON um, output as well. And and really the one big benefit of, of eBPF here, as well as in the context of Cilium and, and Hubble, is that this metadata can be ad added directly in the context of the kernel. So when the eBPF program uh, processes the events that it's seeing, it can actually directly enrich these events with the metadata because it has access to this metadata through uh, eBPF maps. 
So the next step is detection itself. So you can have a look at, at the book. Like I said, uh, Natalia is around from time to time and she can actually sign the book if you can get a, a hold uh, of, of the book. Um, yeah, uh, um, questions on, uh, on that lab specifically? If you have questions, just come on up to the microphones or I can come to you. Otherwise, thank you for spending your time with us this afternoon. It was, a, it, was a, it was such a pleasant surprise seeing so many people show up for this event. So thank you so much. We do have some uh, psyllium and tetragon stickers up in the front. If you'd like one, come on, get one. Yeah. And again, feel free to take the uh, other labs on your own um, and give us uh, feedback. Yeah. Oh, and one thing that you mentioned earlier, uh, just so people know where to find it, to be sure, if you go to the Cilium project, github.com slash Cilium slash Cilium, here, I know you, you mentioned it, <laughs> there's a users.md file. So if you're already using Cilium and you want to help the project, one easy way to help the project is to let us know how you use Cilium, what you do with it, uh, the more companies actually list themselves here, the more it helps the project to graduate. <laughs>